spring has finally sprung. Which must mean only one thing. It's time for a new series. And what a series it's going to be. We'll be following dramatic animal stories from around the UK. And revealing the wildlife in our concrete jungles. We've been given exclusive access to some of the year's most exciting nature stories. We'll be exploring beneath the surface. And celebrating some of the smaller things in life. From the magic of the South Coast to the majesty of the Scottish Isles. We've got the very best of the season's wild drama. Wow, well, what can I say? It's not exactly Game of Thrones, but I'd watch it. Well, I'd we, watch I it. I mean, we've got drama, we've got beauty, we've got science, soap opera, a bit of humour. What more could you want on a bank holiday Monday? Yep, we're back. <laughs> Welcome to Spring Watch. Yes, hello and welcome to the first of our Spring Watch programmes for 2015. Coming to you from the wonderful RSPB Minsmere Reserve here in Suffolk. We're live and as you know we were here last year. They've been uh, foolish enough to invite us back. But nevertheless, I think that we can pack three weeks with some of the best of British wildlife because this truly is a remarkable place. Our cameramen have been out over the weekend to capture some of the flavour of it when the sun Sun comes up, everything's serene. It's got dew dappled heaths here, which are spectacularly beautiful. It's not all about birds, it's also about mammals and insects too, but reed beds do tend to dominate this habitat and they offer us some of the most super sexy species that we've got in the UK. The question is though, where are we geographically? Here's a little map. This uh, represents England, as you can see, south over here, a bit of Wales, but we're over here in the east of England. Nearest towns and cities, Ipswich here and Norwich here, but we're on the coast of Suffolk here at Minsmere. What a spot. We're going to be very nosy and looking at all the wildlife here in Minsmere. And we've really challenged our technical teams this year because we've decided to go further than ever before with our cables. Because there is such a wonderful variety of habitats here at Minsmere, we wanted to bring you a wonderful variety of wildlife. So let's see what they've managed to rig up for us. Just behind us is one of the cameras. You see that body of water? We're calling that the Island Mere camera. Let's have a look at that live now. We've got a great oh, crystal green. Great crystal green. green. That's pretty special, isn't it? Lovely, isn't it? Look at that. Beautiful and, bird. Look at it sly, isn't it? Which they <laughs> do. <laughs> Maybe it's just ready to, to feed. Maybe yeah. it's going to dive under. They do prostrate themselves before they flip themselves up and dive. But no, I think that one might be displaying to something that's out of shape. That looks like a bit of aggression to me, Chris, don't yeah. you think? Yeah. Great birds, though. Well, it's very birds. rare, you know, because they were uh, they were killed off for the plume trade. People like to put their heads, unbelievably, on hats. And that's how the RSPB started, didn't it? Yeah. Because some women got together and tried to ban that trade, and that was the beginning of the RSPB because of those greaves. What about that? Good knowledge. Amazing bird, but it is incredible, actually, the variety of birds that you can get on that camera, because that's a very similar view to the one that people get sitting in the hides. And, of course, they come here to spend hours with their binoculars looking at greaves, marsh harriers, all sorts. Of Hobbies been Hobbies. out there today. Yeah, yeah. even bitterns. 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 <laughs> Let's take a look at one of our other live cameras. This is a first for us on Spring Watch. It's a red shank. It's a medium-sized wader with long, bright orange legs, which obviously you can't see at the moment because this female is sitting on the nest incubating the eggs. So you can't eggs. see the legs. Can they difficult to see the bird at all? Well, it is. Obviously. It is. And do you know why that is, Chris? I do. Well, you probably do, but <laughs> it's because cause you know everything. But it's... Um, I certainly don't. What, it, what this bird does is it carefully folds reeds and tussocks over its body to conceal it. That's what it does. And we've seen it doing a lot of that in the last couple of days. But that does make it a little bit challenging it for us to get a close-up view. It comes back and it sneaks in and then, it, as you say, it creates a little bower for itself. And you can, if you look really carefully, just see its eye in there at the moment. Yeah. I mean, it's very 
very well camouflaged, actually, isn't it? Yeah, it is. yeah. Let's take a look at a very familiar bird for most of us. It's the wren. You get this in your gardens, of course. Uh, there's the nest. It's a single female on there. That's not unusual because the males go off and breed with various females. And look at that. Little chicks. Are they the first little chicks for Springwatch no. 2015 that we've seen? There are five chicks in there. They're about five days old. And as I say, the female is very busy feeding those five little mouths. So those are the li some, just some of the live cameras that we've Fantastic. rigged up for you. Good variety already. Just before we came on air, we saw the female come in with an enormous dragonfly, didn't we? And try and shove it down the <laughs> chick's throat. But it couldn't get in. And she'd flew off with it. <laughs> get you one thing. We've got another live nest. And it's a first, isn't it? Our first underwater, underwater live nest yeah. coming up. That's Worth a bit of a sticking tease. around for, I would underwater say. Underwater live nest. What's that? <laughs> Those are the live cameras. Of course, we've also been filming out and about some of the amazing wildlife around here in the last 24 hours. This is the bearded tit. It's a glorious bird, tawny russet plumage, and the males, which you can't see there, have got this amazing black moustache. Here we've got long-tailed tits and that gorgeous nest lichen on the outside to camouflage it just this morning chris mckellar and i were watching this and we saw we wondered whether the eggs had hatched and we saw a glimpse of white in there and that was the eggs hatching we didn't know if they'd throw the eggs out or eat the eggshell but in the end they ate the eggshell and this it's 0736 a.m this morning and it's the otter down on the mere and i can tell you now those otters have already been causing us a lot of trouble it's always good to see them though, isn't it? Yeah, I love seeing an otter. Yeah. Do you know, we've also got a water vole camera, which has been providing us with actually more than we thought. Let's take a look. Very lucky to see these creatures. Look at that, that's, we think that's a juvenile. You can see it's quite small by the size of that apple. Um, here's an it adult. It might depend on the size of the apple. <laughs> well, it was a small yeah, apple, a small yeah. apple. Now, this, this is nighttime, obviously, and this, this one is a bit of a nosy water vole, this one. It's come to check out the camera. Um, maybe it's even trying to eat the eat camera, it. clean that's the camera, goodness knows what. <laughs> But as I say, these are really privileged views because they're, they're very elusive, very shy creatures, hardly ever see them. And uh, what you normally do see is the tail because you hear that plop as it goes into yeah, the water and, and that's what you see. So yeah. great to see these water voles close up. Actually, we're going to put them to the test a bit later. I can feel another sort of feeding trial coming on here. I think we should try these. They don't want to eat apple. We should no. try them with some natural food and maybe even see if they're a bit carnivorous or from a bit of fish or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. Break you've got a rules. water vole on a plate like that, you've got to do something with it scientifically. <laughs> Not on, a, not on a plate. No, not on a plate. Literally, no, no, no. Not on a plate. Now, don't forget that you can watch those cameras 24 hours a day, or you can join in the sort of conversation on social media. That's on our email address or on Twitter. Right. Now, why are we here? Have a look at this. Springwatch has set up shop in the Suffolk countryside. 120 people. 30 cameras and 20 miles of cable. We've got one of the best nature reserves in Britain under surveillance. A stunning mosaic of habitats, home to more than 5,000 species and some of the rarest animals in the country. This year, Cutting-edge technology will reveal the lives of our characters in intimate detail. We'll be tracking Minsmere's badgers with GPS collars and finding out what they get up to under the cover of darkness. We're on a mission to uncover the secrets and revel in the beauty of one of the wildest places in the land. This is obviously a wonderful place to be looking for wildlife. Now, my job throughout the series is to get out and about and go to some of the more remote places. Tomorrow, I'm going to be actually out at sea, hopefully. Next day, I'm getting hands-on with adders, possibly. And then I'm going up a tree to the top of the tallest oak tree we can find on Thursday. But tonight, I'm going a little bit closer to home. I'm going about half a kilometre off in that direction to try to see one of the most iconic animals that they have here at Minsmere. So I'll see you a little bit later on. See you later. Okay. Thank you. Good luck. Bye -bye. He's so intrepid, isn't he? So intrepid. No, he's not intrepid. Actually, he's more 
Irrumpent. Irrumpent. Good He's word. Irrumpent. What does it That's mean? That's my spring word <laughs> of today. And every day I'm going to introduce you to a spring word, courtesy of my colleague Susie Dent on Countdown. <laughs> Today's is irrumpent. What it actually means, Makeda, is bursting forth through a surface. So you might say, for instance, the bluebells were a spectacle of irrumpent colour. I might well say that. You might, because your challenge is to oh. use that word during the course of the rest of the programme. Oh, well, let me start then. Is it uh, not now? Oh, not now. Obviously, you've got to weave it in seamlessly during the rest oh, of the okay. program. Okay, I'll do my best. Okay. I'll do my best. Irrumpent. There we are. New word for spring. But what about one of the charismatic birds of this region? Something that's very, very special and particular to this and a few other sites in the country. The one and the only stone curlew. Now, we had a glimpse of them last year, but this year they've nested a little bit later. And this has given us a unique opportunity to see the eggs hatching. Here are the adult birds, and you can see that they're ringed. And we know, therefore, that the female was hatched in Wheating, just across the way, in 2007, and the male's a local lad who hatched in 2010. And it's typical that the males do nest close to her, but look at this. You can see the wet down of the chick there, Michaela. That one's freshly hatched. Not a happy looking bird, I don't think. Oh, I don't know. I think it looks quite content. Well, it's it's content. Of, I don't know, they've got a sort of sour look on their face. Probably oh, like most Hull City fans chicks. when they woke up this morning, to be quite honest with you. <laughs> But look at that. That is absolutely fantastic, isn't it? Now, they are quite rare. I have to say, in the 30s, there were probably about 2,000 pairs of these things. By the 90s, they'd gone down to about 160 pairs. Now, they bounce back. There's been some really good conservation, and we're up to about 375 pairs. But we're not going to see much more of them, are we, Chris? Because they're going, they're, they're going to wander off pretty soon. Well, they will wander off. You can see that one there. They leave the nest before they can even properly walk. But, of course, they're immediately vulnerable. So what the adults like to do is lead them off to some patches of nettles or scrub where they can hide because they're vulnerable to all sorts of predators. There are about seven pairs of them here at Minzeer Nesting and uh, well we thought it'd be interesting to see what they do at night because they're crepuscular that's why they have those huge eyes so they can see in low light and crepuscular means that they forage in dawn and dusk so we sent a cameraman out with a thermal imaging camera to see what goes on at dusk or dawn and now it's very difficult to see where the nest is but it's at the forefront of that picture and there's there's a fence between the nest and what you can see behind which is very interesting so you've got rabbits badger and you've got a fox. So it's a jolly good job that that nest is there because... A jolly good job the fence is there. I mean, the, the fence is there. That's what I meant to say. It's a jolly good job the fence is there because obviously that fox would predate on the eggs and yeah. it would yeah. be there. The surprising thing is, I checked today because I thought they'd be very vulnerable to predators and therefore not very successful, but 70% of the eggs hatch and about 77% of their young get at least halfway through the fledging process. Really? That's much higher than I imagined it would be. Yeah, because, I mean, it, it looks vulnerable. It's out in the open. Mm. It's very mm. easy to see. Yeah. But obviously, not... if that fence hadn't been there, that would be a... Let's hope the battery's charged, shall we? Let's just hope <laughs> the battery's charged. Now, I've often said, and uh, said it before, and I'll say it again, that some birds are equal, but others, some are more equal than others, to be quite honest with you. And the goshawk and the sparrowhawk are certainly in that category, one of my favourite birds. And earlier this year, I had a unique opportunity to meet up with one of the country's leading raptor ecologists to pit the goshawk against the sparrowhawk. What about that? The sparrowhawk, featherweight of the British raptors, a masterful predator and a classic opportunist that has made our gardens one of its favourite hunting grounds. But now this supreme little predator is under attack itself because there's a new kid on the block. The goshawk. Now, you could argue that it's just a big sparrowhawk. It lives in similar territory, it hunts similar prey. But how do they really compare? Today, we're pitting them, one against the other. In the blue corner, weighing only 132 grams, Zack the Sparrowhawk. And in the red corner, weighing a massive 992 grams, is Ellie the Goshawk. To find out which is the ultimate hunter, we are setting the birds three challenges to test their agility, their speed and their acceleration. But who will be crowned the champ? 
Round one, agility. Both these species are woodland specialists that are superbly adapted for twisting and turning through the trunks, the branches and the bushes when they're hunting. So this is going to be a great opportunity to see just how quickly and tightly they can turn. World-renowned hawk expert Dr Ian Newton is here to ref the match. And first up, it's the sparrowhawk. Oh, oh, goodness me! Can't see that with the naked eye. No, I can't, I can't see. <laughs> How does any small bird survive in the garden? Yeah. This should be a health and safety film for blue tits. Unsurprisingly, the featherweight sparrowhawk nails the agility test. But how will the heavyweight goshawk fare? Oh, look at that. Well, she did that incredibly well. I mean, that's a right angle bend. And she hardly moved more than maybe six inches from the fence all the way around. Look at her tail. She's turning her tail out to break against the wind yeah, there. Yeah. It's like a great sail steering it well, around that's that That's what it is, yeah. What do you think then, Ian, when it comes to agility? The A factor, if you like. Sparrowhawk has it every time, I think. The goshawk's incredible for its size, but the sparrowhawk just is unbelievable. OK, so they're both very agile, but the smaller sparrowhawk just edges the first round. It's closer than I expected, though, if you consider that the goshawk is almost eight times heavier than the sparrowhawk. What an incredible performance. But now, let's test their speed and acceleration. We've measured out two courses, one 45 metres and another 15 metres. Can the heavyweight goshawk make a comeback? Or will the featherweight sparrowhawk be too fast to catch? To be the first three or four pumps of the wings that will really take it to moving. Typical sparrowhawk, low to the ground, close to the hedge. Oh, 4.68. Four point eight eight. We put them through their paces. Four point zero six. Four point seven five. Nothing beats seeing them fly. It's like a little missile coming down there. So once again, it's an incredibly close round. The smaller, lighter Sparrowhawk reaches a top speed of 36 kilometers per hour with an acceleration of 5.5 meters per second squared. Amazingly, this is only fractionally faster than the much heavier Goshawk. So the Goshawk has similar agility, speed and acceleration to its smaller cousin. This is bad news for the Sparrowhawk because it's on the Goshawk's menu. Goshawks, being a bigger version of the sparrowhawk in many ways, uh, are quite capable of catching sparrowhawks. And indeed they do. Sparrowhawks are definitely scared of goshawks. No question about that. As goshawks have colonised different parts of Britain as they've made their return, sparrowhawks have gone down. Now, that's partly due to predation, but it's also due to the fact that sparrowhawks are increasingly confined to the younger, denser, thicker woods so it's a more natural system. A far more natural at. situation. This is as it should be. Sparrowhawks have had it their own way for a long time, but not anymore. The goshawk is back. Yes, they're back. There's absolutely no doubt about it. They're back in force. We think that we have at least 400 pairs of goshawks now in the UK. And some of you might be pleased to hear that because they absolutely hammer corvids. They eat crows and magpies and all of those sorts of things. And particularly grey squirrels when they're living in cities. And certainly in other parts of Europe, they do so. Berlin, for example, has 19 pairs of urban goshawk. What about that? Well, at the moment, they don't live in our cities, and that means that our sparrowhawks still continue to do very well there, as James Cope will tell you, because he has an office in Guildford, and this is the view out of his window. It looks like a pine tree. 
It's pleasant enough, of course, but when you zoom into the pine tree, this is the view that James gets out of his office window. It's a currently a female sparrowhawk incubating her eggs. It's going to be fantastic when they hatch and those birds start feeding there. I think James is going to have to give office time off for everyone to enjoy that spectacle. So at the moment, at least in our towns, the good old sparrowhawk is doing well, and that pleases me as it's my favourite bird. Now, as you know, Martin has gone off on his mission. Let's just hope that it's not impossible. No, it's not impossible today at all, Chris. Like, one of the reasons there's so much wildlife here is because there are so many habitats. Look, there's a woodland there, there's a reed beds here, but come with me, because there's one very special habitat behind this bird hide. It's called the scrape. Now, careful up the stairs. Why on earth is it called the scrape? I mark. Have a look out the window. Ooh. Can you see all that out there? You can see birds flittering around. To understand why it's called a scrape, really we need to go up into the air and have a proper look at it. There it is, and you can see big lagoons. It's, it's the watery area to the bottom of the camera. They used bulldozers in the 1960s to actually scrape the vegetation off those little islands. Now, why on earth would you want to scrape the vegetation off? That's because many of the more exotic birds that live out there, they need just bare soil to nest on. If it grows up too much, they'll overgrow it and they won't be able to nest. So the RSPB have to constantly scrape back. So this is the scrape. It's so important that we have cameras all over it. We have wildlife cameramen like Mark here who will be covering it all the time. And we've even got, don't know if you can see it, way over there, We've got an exotic robot camera. It's called the U5. It's the scrape cam. Nobody's operated. They can operate it from a kilometre away. And that's constantly looking across the scrape to see what we've got. Let's, let's go to it now and see what he's getting. What have we got? There you go. There's an avocet there. Oh, we're seeing me, are we? Oh, lovely. Hello. <laughs> Me. Sorry, I got sucked into watching, watching what the camera was getting. So that's me. Let's have a look at what that scrape camera is also managing to film. OK, oh, there we go. That's over there's black-headed gulls. And we've got an avocet in the foreground. You can see it's absolutely packed with birds, and many of them will be using that bare ground to nest on. Now, those birds are all absolutely fascinating, but... The real jewel in the crown here is not those birds, it's the avocet. And Mark, can you give us an avocet? Um, we've got one on the nest just here. Got one on the nest? Here we go. There's the avocet with a goose in the background. Now, this is a fascinating story. The avocets were extinct here in the UK for over 100 years, extinct for over 100 years, and then in 1947, they returned. And that return, just, just four of them, returned here to Minsmere, nesting. And that, that stimulated a massive conservation effort, and it was rewarded with success. Because now, this year, there's about 50 pairs nesting here. Up on last year, there were 45. And as of today, there are 30 avocet chicks here. You can see this one feeding away, using that upturned bill to sift out little crustaceans. These shallow pools are perfect for them to feed. This is lovely, let's just, we're just enjoying it. This is bird watching. This is what you do in this hide. Now, it is surprising when those avocets nest, they actually nest right out in the open there. And you might think that's a bit of a, a strange thing to do because they're very, very exposed. And they're not even camouflaged or anything like that. But they are very, very aggressive. Some people call avocets exocets because they're like missiles. They'll attack goose or other birds that come near the nest. However, sometimes there are things that are just too much even for the most feisty avocet. Now, cast your mind back to last year. The time is about four o'clock in the morning. Our cameras are running and one of the avocet chicks has just hatched. Then we saw this. Here's that avocet. Flies off the nest. Why? There's that chick. You just see it moving. Suddenly, the dripping badger turns up. 
a badger had swum across the water here on the scrape and started to munch its way through all the nests. This was an absolute tragedy for us. We've been watching this avocet nest. The chick had only been out for about five minutes. The badger then went along the whole of this island and cleaned out every single nest that was there. We, we estimated that it probably ate around 5,000 calories. 5,000 calories, that's as much as I'd eat in two days. Can't blame the badger, the badger's got cubs as well, but it was a complete disaster for us. So what on earth could we do? Could we stop that badger doing it again? Well, we'll find that out a little bit later on. Now, imagine yourself out in the garden or near a body of water in a pond and you look down and there's a shaft of light glinting there and there hanging motionless in the water is a little sort of water dragon. It's a newt. Newts are magic. It's a cool, damp night in early spring. After six months on land, one of Britain's rarest amphibians is returning to the pond where she was born. On land, she's vulnerable. So she travels under the cover of darkness. But once she reaches water, this great crested newt will become a voracious predator. Common frogs have already been and gone, leaving thousands of eggs protected only by their jelly. No defense against a hungry newt. But she hasn't just come to the pond to feast. She has her own eggs to lay. But first, she requires the services of a mate. Overnight, male newts have made their way to the pond. Only the most alluring will win her affection. They're dressed to impress with extravagant crests grown especially for their courtship dance. All the better to show off their moves. But the female's far from impressed. She's proving hard to please. Eventually, her most flamboyant suitor sees off the competition and catches her eye. Finally, he has the fussy female under his spell. She's captivated by his every move. He drops a packet of sperm and quickly leaves the scene. She carefully positions herself over it and takes it into her body. Now her eggs are fertilized, she needs somewhere safe to lay them. Unlike the frogs, she won't leave them exposed. She's looking for the perfect leaf and she's as fussy as ever. She needs a leaf that is clean and flexible. But why? 
She has skills in aquatic origami. Once she's found the perfect leaf, she lays a single green egg under it and gently folds it out of sight. The egg is coated with a sticky secretion. She squeezes the leaf together and waits for the glue to set. She remains patiently statuesque for three minutes. Over the next month, she'll hide four or five eggs every day, most of which will hatch. Our devoted diva has stacked the odds firmly in her offspring's favor. Fantastic. Really Absolutely was. Absolutely fantastic. Really when I was a kid, I was always down in the marshes, down in the ponds, catching newts, because those male like cresteds were the closest thing to a stegosaurus <laughs> that I could possibly get. <laughs> and one winter, I shouldn't tell you this, it's a terrible admission, I had them in the garage over winter, and the tank froze solid. Oh, no. Seriously. That's terrible. The two newts were in there like Frankenstein, oh, no. like that. It cracked the glass, picked it up, put it in another bigger tank, it remelted, they both survived, and they bred successfully. So they erumpently rose from the freeze. They, they, indeed they did. I got the word in. They erumped. <laughs> I'm not sure that erumped is actually a word. Erumpently. Erumpent. Boy, oh, so, yes. Yeah. Now, you know, here at Minsmere on Spring Watch, we, we like to celebrate the things that everybody comes to see, the sexy things like the, the bittens, the bearded tits, the badgers, the buzzards, but we also like to big up the little guys, the ones that people tend to overlook. And with that in mind, we've set up our very first ever underwater mm -hmm. nest cam, and it's down here, mm -hmm. just under the boardwalk. You can see the camera there, and we've got a hydrophone to get the sound as well. But do you have any idea what that might be filming? What nest is down there? Well, I'm going to tell you, it's the nest of a stickleback. Hmm, but what is a stickleback? Well, our stickleback is a three-spined stickleback. It's one of 16 species of the small anadromous fish. Do you know what anadromous fish is? Oh, I don't. What's that then? It's one that occurs in fresh and salt mm. water, sometimes commuting between the two. Although these ones are likely to have got stuck in the fresh water thousands of years ago and adapted to that environment. They're normally about five centimetres long. Sometimes they can stretch to ten. But you know the most interesting thing for me about these fish is that they don't have scales. Really? No scales at all. Some of them have armoured plates. Those that you typically find in salt water have a few more. But they've all got those spines, and of course they're to protect them from predators because they can erect those spines and it makes it difficult for them to swallow if you're a, a predator of any kind. And that one that we showed you was a male and it has that fantastic red colour. And that's what a red, well, that's what a male stickleback should look like. This is what Arthur looks like. He's not quite so resplendent, is he? He's got a little bit of red, but he's a great, great guy. He's building his nest. Look, he's only got two spines as well, so we're actually calling him Spineless Simon. You know, he's not big, he's not clever, but we've grown to love him. But as I say, he's a modern man type of fish because it's the males that build the nests. and. It, Look what he's doing now. This is this sort of vibrating thing he's doing because that's a nest underneath there. I know it it's, doesn't look like a nest, but it is. And, and what they do is they release spigin, which is actually a gluey mucus thread that they spin from their kidneys. It's called anal gluing, and it glues that nest what, together. One of us, I mean. Well, look, look what he's doing now. He's attracted a female. He does this ziggy zaggy dance. You could see the eggs. Did you see the eggs, Chris? I can. She's gravid. Look at that. But she's too big. She's too she big. She is too and big. He's trying too hard. The fool. <laughs> Look at him. Leave her alone. Honestly. Look. He's virtually trying to force her into the nest. I'm... And quite, you know, quite understandably, she's just well kicked up a furore of silt and left. It all went horribly wrong, didn't it? But I think it's because that nest, as I say, it's very difficult to see, but it's it's sort of like a bower underneath the silty bottom that he's built, and I don't think he's built it big enough. She couldn't get in, he could she? didn't build the chamber big enough. Spineless sigh, get it together. <laughs> anyway, that was the least of his problems, because just after midnight last night, our camera was running on the nest, and this is what happens. Look! Oh, it's disaster! Otterzilla! 
trampling through the nest and then it turns into some sort of stickleback independence day. I mean, look at this. Here we are. In comes the otter, down goes its great big webbed clodhopper right on top of spineless sized nest. Oh, it's he's ruined it. wiped out. It's a stickleback wipeout. Of course he goes back and look at the, I mean, I don't like to anthropomorphise, but I mean, take a look at, the, take a look at his face. Forlorn. He's I'd say. He is forlorn. He's devastated. He's devastated. What do you think he'll do now? Will he try again? I don't know. Why don't we go live to the camera to see if Spineless Psy is actually down there? Is that possible? Can we go and have a look? I mean, look, you can sometimes see him from up here, but can we see him is live he... on the camera? He's uh, not there. Oh, well, I, all I can say is keep, you know, keep your eyes peeled for Spineless Psy. He's one of the stars of the show. I mean, you know, BBC <laughs> One, they've just had a series on sharks, three programmes. Probably cost millions all over the world. We've got a stickleback. We're going to blow those sharks out of the water with a spineless stickleback, I promise you. I feel the nation's love coming towards spineless Simon. I think we ought to move on. I think we should. We're not just filming around here at Minsmere. Of course, we've got cameras all over the UK. And in fact, we've sent our colleague Yolo Williams 700 miles north of here, right up to the Scottish Isles. Where's he gone? He's gone all the way up here. Here we have the mainland of Scotland. Here we've got John O'Groats. Here's the Orkney Isles here and here's Shetland. He's going to go right to the top to Outstack which is right here. The question is how far has he got yet? The northeast corner of Scotland has to be one of the most spectacular landscapes in the British Isles. A dramatic coastline, sculpted by constant battering from some of the world's strongest tides and currents. Making it the perfect home for nesting seabirds. Wow, look at this. I'm eye level with thousands of nesting seabirds. Mainly guillemots, also kittiwakes. There's some razorbills tucked out the way. Masses of them stacked into these shelves. The guillemots are all facing inwards towards the rock and they, they're guarding their egg. And because of the massed ranks, any passing herring girl or a raven just can't get in there to steal the egg. I don't think I've ever been this close to a nesting colony like this. It's an amazing experience. You can just see everything that's going on. You can see some mutual preening, some bickering with your next door neighbor. It's like coming into a cosmopolitan city. And this is an ideal location for these nesting birds because you've got the, the sheer cliffs rising, what, 30, 40 meters up? But you've also got the rock strata, the layers of rock. These have created small shelves so they're safe out of the way of any passing foxes or stoats or weasels. And also, we're in a sheltered little cove here. It's the ideal spot for these nesting seabirds. At the top of these massive cliffs is softer ground. It's the perfect place for the nation's favorite seabird to make its home. The puffin. The spring breeding season is just beginning. Time to clean out the burrow. Make new friends. Fend off rivals and get down to the serious business of starting a family. I never tired of seeing puffins and hopefully we'll be seeing a lot more of them over the next few weeks. Now, two miles back down the coast here, 
is John O'Groats. And for people traveling up from Land's End in Cornwall, it's the end of the line. But the true end of the line is here. This is the most northeasterly point in mainland Britain. But for me, this is just the start of an epic journey. For Spring Watch this year, I'm gonna be heading north. 171 miles further north, through Orkney, through Shetland, all the way to a tiny rock called Outstack, the most northerly point in the whole of the British Isles. First, we're going to head to Orkney to see one of my favourite birds, the magnificent hen harrier. We'll be taking a look at Orkney's underwater world and its dramatic coastline. And then on to Shetland, one of the best places in the world to see otters. This wild and rugged landscape is also home to beautiful bird life and an array of other friendly characters. With all that wildlife, I cannot begin to tell you just how excited I am about this journey. But there's one animal that I want to see above all else. And two were seen just off this point last week. Orcas, killer whales. I have never seen orcas in my life. Now, the first step for us is across the Pentland Firth to Orkney. Brilliant place for wildlife. And who knows, on the way, we might just see some orcas. Fingers crossed. Orcas, killer whales. Will Yolo get lucky? Tune in tomorrow to find out. Now, after the predation of the badgers on the Avocets in last year's Spring Watch, clearly something had to be done, and by golly, something has been done. Look at this. What does it actually take to stop a hungry badger, sort of fence-wise? OK, let's ask three questions. How strong does this fence have to be to stop a badger. Well, look, badger has got the most incredibly powerful bite. Do you see that ridge along the top of the skull there? That's a sagittal ridge or sagittal ridge. Now, the muscles of the badger's jaw here attach to that ridge, and that shows just how strong it is. You can feel your own. If you bite, you can feel those temporal muscles. Ours only go to there. The badgers go all the way up and gives it the most incredibly powerful bite. Badger's bite is five times more powerful than that of the wild cat. OK, so it has to be super strong like this, and it is. OK, what else would it have to be? How high does the fence have to be? Well, you wouldn't think that badgers were all that good at climbing. Wrong, because we found out this last year. Badgers will come out, and here's a badger trying to climb a tree. You can hear its claws clacking away. But it does a very good job. Badgers have been recorded five metres up trees. Surprising, perhaps. OK, so it has to be pretty high up to there. But then, as that, that wasn't enough, this one goes up electric fence up here and I can tell you what while we were <laughs> while we were rehearsing this I touched this electric fence it's 6,000 volts and Chris I erupted no what's the right word uh, I was erumpent I burst forth because it gives you a heck of a jolt and then here on the door here it leans out so if the badger got up there it wouldn't be able to get up there so it has to be this high and it has to have this electric fence on it okay what else does it have to do badgers are classic diggers. Their, their claws, let's go down, come on down. Their front feet, front paws have got these, it's a bit like a digger, you know, that you see on a building site. They've got these great big claws and then the buckets here and it goes, ah, uh, ah. Uh. And so they'll get down, careful, <laughs> I don't want to touch that again. And they'll be able to just dig down into this. Down they'll go, and do you know what? I'm doing pretty well here. If I was a badger, I'd be getting quite optimistic by now. But in fact, the badger wouldn't get that far because this is how the fence works. It goes down into the ground here, about 25, 30 centimetres, but then there's another bit that comes out towards us to stop the badger going down like that. 
So if the badger was going to actually get underneath this fence, it would have to come back maybe about here and start to dig underneath before it would actually start to move along there. And we estimate, we've calculated, it would take a badger three hours to dig underneath there. Now this fence goes about two kilometers all the way around the whole of the scrape here. They're really not taking any chances. It's honestly like Fort Knox. And you would think probably that with all that effort, the strength of the fence, the electricity, everything, the badgers wouldn't be able to get through. So all the birds out there, just out there on the scrape, they're all safe, aren't they? Or are they? Look what we just managed to film a little earlier. Look at this badger right up against the fence, digging furiously. Look at that. He's got his collar on. This is one of the badgers that we've collared, so we know its movements. But look how energetic it is. The power of those forepaws, just digging, digging. Of course, it doesn't realise it's about to come up against that extra bit of fence sticking out. Look at the power. We've even seen them biting it as well. Look at that. But it can't get through. OK, so far, so good. But will the badgers get through? Will the fence hold? We'll find out throughout the next three weeks. To be very honest with you, the relationship between predators and prey is something that often vexes people who manage nature reserves. And on that account, on Unsprung tonight, at the end of this program, I'm going to be talking to Adam Rowlands, who's currently in charge of Minsmere here, about this very problem. So if you want to watch that, press the red button or watch it online when we finish tonight. Because you're taking the reins, aren't you, for Unsprung? Taking the reins. Anything could happen. <laughs> Now, on Spring Watch, we use lots of different camera techniques to get our footage, and one of those is time-lapse. And it's a technique that was used extensively on David Attenborough's Private Life of Plants that was shown on the telly a few years ago. One of the main cameramen on that was Richard Kirby. So we sent him out with a time-lapse camera to capture the beauty of his local patch. I seem to spend most of my life in rainforests. And you can look up at the trees and see that every species is just fighting for the little chinks of light. It's a battlefield. When I'm at home, Robert Common is on my doorstep. And looking at it closely, you begin to realize that it's exactly like a rainforest. It's a thousand acre battlefield, three inches high. You've got to get right down to the ground level to see what's going on. I use time lapse a lot to speed up the growth processes. I love the idea of being able to record events that you can't perceive with the human eye. Every plant seems to have its own strategy for getting ahead of its neighbours. First one species and then another species starts to pop up and grow and you can see them trying to outgrow each other. There's a little battle going on down there. I love the cowslips. It's one of the first species to flower. I've never been anywhere in England where there are so many as there are here. Common is butterfly heaven. 
One of the real rarities here, and a species that I absolutely adore, is the Duke of Burgundy butterfly. Much tinier than you might expect. Two centimetres across the wings. They have beautiful little faces. It's a very feisty little butterfly. They love to fight. And what's extraordinary about them is that each colony lives in a very, very small area, maybe no more than 20 square meters of grassland. But you put your hand on the ground and it's palpably warm. It's out of the wind and it's moist. So you get this tiny little microclimate that is probably just an inch or so above the ground. And this is where a lot of the insects like to hang out. Ground hoppers. They're only about as long as my little fingernail. They stay really close to the ground and feed almost exclusively on mosses and lichens. great green bush cricket. It's Britain's largest insect, although well, you'd never know from this one. It's only about five millimetres long at the moment. But by the end of the summer, it'll be almost three inches long. I travel all over the world filming plants and animals, but right here on my own doorstep. In its own way, this is just as thrilling. Not a bad local patch there, pretty stunning. But mind you, look at what we've got. This is our local patch for the next three weeks here at Minsbay, but we are going to share it with you. Not just the beauty of the outdoors, but the coziness of this indoor studio as well. Well, it'd be cozy if they closed the doors. <laughs> it's it's chilly today, isn't it? It, it is chilly It's very chilly, chilly here, it's surprising. There's a vast number of midges out as well. But we asked you to get out into your local patch and help us with a survey that we launched on Spring Watch at Easter, our special that we did. And it was called the Big Spring Watch, and it was in conjunction with the Woodland Trust. And we asked you to go and look for five specific signs of spring so that we could see if spring was coming earlier or later and also how it spreads through the country. Well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much to everybody who did the survey. We had loads of people, didn't we? Loads indeed. 17,000 people registered. And of those, we got 21,640 reports of those five things that we were looking for. Here's a map here showing the distribution of all of those reports, which is pretty good. As you can see, everywhere that's busy with people, perhaps not the uh, centre of Wales here and parts of the north of England and southern Scotland and, of course, the top of Scotland here, sent in lots and lots of reports. Now, the first species that we're going to take a look at today is one with which we're really familiar. We got 6,177 reports of swallows. Now, swallows are a sub-Saharan migrant, as you know. They come here to breed in the summer, and then they migrate all the way back to South Africa for the winter. But their return to the UK in spring is something that's always been noted. People have kept records of this for hundreds and hundreds of years. So this is an ideal species for us to look at if we want to see any changes in that arrival date. Well, this year, where did they turn up first? The 14th of March, they were seen down here in Kent. A few had already strayed up here, but the majority were in that part of the country at this time. But let's have a look at how things unfolded. I'll just expand the map here if I can control the infamous touch screen. Here we are, that'll do. Uh, by the 13th of April, the majority of swallow sightings had reached here, Oxford. By the 15th of April, they'd got up here as far as Manchester, and here on the 16th, they'd reached Newcastle, a line going east to west through North Newcastle. After that, on the 20th, the rest had turned up here. So that's the sort of movement that we saw, Martin. It was, yeah, Chris. And I always record it, Chris, every year. It fits in. The arrival of your swallow. The arrival of the swallows this year. I get a bit carried away. Look, first swallow. So I do get carried away a little bit. I did an explosion too. <laughs> 
<laughs> that was on the 7th of April, so that fits in perfectly with what you were saying. Yeah. And it was down here on a farm up on the Mendips. I see it every year there. When we further analysed this, we, it gave us the capability of seeing how quickly the swallows were moving up through the country, literally measuring the speed of spring. In this case, we found that the swallows were moving north at about 93 kilometres a day. For those still using Imperial, that's about 58 miles. So that's quite a speed of spring. And what we're going to do is assemble this information that we've got with Swallow with the other four parameters that we've recorded. So at the end of the series, we might be able to tell you whether this spring was happening a little faster or a little slower than normal. Well, that's all potentially to do with climate, but what about weather? Because that's what's going to affect our wildlife here at Minsmere. And let's face it, it's been a pretty strange spring this year. But to give you more details, let's go over to Nick Miller at the Weather Centre. Hi, Nick. Hello, Michaela. It has been a spring with a sting in its tail. Those early swallows took advantage of a promising start to the season. March average, but then April, it warmed up. And we had our sunniest April on record in the UK. The sun frequently and visibly irrumpent from the horizon. But as we know, spring has slowed to a crawl. Since then, it has cooled down. This was the scene in the Lake District last week. By day here, temperatures are running as much as three degrees below normal for May and it's all down to these. Since about mid-April we've had frequently northwesterly winds from a cold North Atlantic literally flying in the face of some of those birds coming our way. They come from Africa, they stop off in Europe and think I'm not going to make that final jog to the UK until I lose the headwind. It's too much like hard work. We're still waiting for more swallows, sand martins, reed warblers. And this may have slowed things in your garden too. Still waiting for the first young birds. Maybe that non-red-breasted robin hopping about wanting food. Change the weather pattern, we'll get spring back on track. Not going to happen yet. High pressure this week is pulling away. Low pressure is coming in Wednesday to Thursday with rain. And then once that's moved away, even stronger cool west northwesterly winds. So what does that mean for you at Minsmere? Well, it's spring watch fleece weather this week. Temperatures at or below normal. Rain Wednesday night, even stronger winds to blow the reed beds around later. Don't worry, this isn't snow. This is a hail shower possible on Friday. When will it change? June, of course, is just around the corner. There are signs of high pressure building back in and changing the wind from northwesterly to easterly. Flaming, I'm not so sure, but we may just turn up to a slow simmer. We'll see. <laughs> Hail on Friday. Good job we're not live on Friday then, isn't it? No, but I'm riding my motorbike back to Bristol <laughs> and I get drenched. We've just got time to go around some of the live cameras. Let's have a look at our blue tits, a perennial favourite. Oh. Now, we're going to deal with them a lot more through the weeks. We're a little bit worried about that female there because she's looking a little bit scruffy. I think there are ten chicks underneath her. That's a lot, isn't it? That's a lot. There they are. They're doing well, though. On the scrape camera, there she is as Chris called her, the Audrey Hepburn of the bird world. Oh, Look at the bird. elegance yeah. of that. Elegant. And Abba Abba said, beautiful. That beautiful. Very elegant. Absolutely well, sadly, gorgeous. we're coming to the end of our programme now, but do stay tuned if you want a little bit more. Unsprung is coming up at the moment. I'll be talking to Adam Rowlands about predators on the reserve and also taking a look at this remarkable photograph. This has become known as the weasel pecker. Ooh. It's taken by <laughs> Martin oh, Lomay, and he's going to be joining us for Unsprung. So that's on Red Button and online coming up soon. And, of course, you can continue watching our live cameras on Red Button and you can join Brett Westwood tomorrow at 7 a.m. for breaking breakfast men's me news <laughs> lovely what have we got coming up tomorrow let's have badges, a look. all sorts of things let's have a look our collared badges here they come we'll be tracking them around the site and will yolo be able to see these fabulous creatures orcas we'll have to wait and will see will spineless simon the stickleback find love in the mud find out tomorrow <laughs> bye bye, bye, -bye. <laughs>